I just wanted to give you just a, a brief overview in relation to what it is we're all about. We've, within our, our geriatric education center, we developed what is a model um, learning series around art and aging. And what we hope to accomplish by the end of our four-part seminar series is to create greater awareness among health professionals in particular and health professions, faculty, and students around what the passion of art and the art form means to the artist and how this intersects with health and the meaning it has that all of us as health professionals really need to consider in our practice as we care for older adults. The objectives that we hope people will be able to accomplish are several, and those are to increase awareness and knowledge relating to the impact of art and aging, and how artful creativity matters to the overall health of the body, mind, and spirit of the older adult, to address the intersection of the role of art in aging and health of the older adult, to create greater affirmative attitudes towards aging through the use of art, and to identify the relationship between artful creativity and the sense of self and relationships with others and quality of life, as well as to increase knowledge of effort, effects of creativity on older adults in relation to positive decision making and patient self-management. We have special thanks to um, Cultural Resources, Inc., and this is Kathleen Mundell, and I'll introduce you to Kathleen in a moment, and the Maine Arts Commission. We would like to thank the Maine Arts Commission for allowing us to bring their 2 times 10, which is a traveling art exhibit that has been, um, has been developed and created by the Maine Arts Commission with a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And we'll talk to you a little bit more about that. And as you can see, um, part of the traveling art exhibit we've hung on the walls here in the WCHP lecture hall. And uh, they're really beautiful pieces they reflect the Main Arts Commission um, traditional arts program, really featuring master Maine artists. And they'll be hung on these walls through February of 2011. We also have co-sponsorship by the UNE WCHP, the College of Health Professions Interprofessional Education Collaborative, and through our own Geriatric Education Center here at the university. I'd like to, um, for a moment, just review the program with you. Everybody should have picked up a program on the table outside when you, when you signed your sign-in sheet. And we'll begin in the first part. We'll, we'll begin with more of a discussion around life review um, facilitated by Kathleen Mundell on the left. From, who is a folklorist from Cultural Resources, Inc., who we're very fortunate to, uh, to have with us this evening. And Kathleen will facilitate all of our um, seminar series. And Molly Neptune Parker, um, who is our, we are so very fortunate to have Molly um, be with us this evening. And Molly um, and her grandson, George Parker, who is a, both our Passamaquoddy basket makers um, of worldwide renown, and so that we are very fortunate to have both of them here this evening. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Charlotte Paolini, who has gone out to answer a page, um, but when she comes back in, I will, I will point Charlotte out to you. Um, and Raleigh, who is uh, managing our, our uh, IT this evening. So the first hour will be more of a facilitated discussion around life review, and then the second, second part will more, we'll focus more on how the art form, especially basket making, really brings joy to someone's life and how it intersects with art. And as health professionals, why that's really important for us to consider that as we care for our patients. And then um, we'll conclude with a reception um, that we'd like to invite you to. Uh, Sodexo will come in and, and we'll just have very light uh, cheese and crackers and an opportunity for you to talk with, with Molly and George to take a look at these beautiful baskets. And um, for those of you who came in a little bit early, Molly was going over some of, um, some of her pieces with us and, and her tools, and they're very, very interesting. So that we'd like you to stay for a few moments and uh, join us for that reception. 
Couple other um, housekeeping, and that is when you came in, everybody picked up a what we call a GEC tracker form, and that is this form, if I may. It's two-sided. It's uh, I apologize for the um, all of the detail that has to be filled in. Fill in what you can, because we are a federally funded uh, grant. We are required by HRSA to provide demographic information regarding the programs that we present. We have also given you an evaluation form to fill out. Um, that will be very helpful to us as we continue to um, adapt and reevaluate our programs as we move forward. And then there's a flyer that uh, will give you more information about signing up for the other three in our seminar series. Bathrooms are out this door and around the corner. And um, I think we can begin. Questions, when people have questions, even though we're a very informal and very small but mighty crowd, I would ask that uh, people use the mic um, because it is being videoed and the projection is just much better if, if people can use the mic. All right. Kathleen. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here this evening. I should hold it up. Or is it scary? <laughs> um, is that better? Okay. Um, Thank you for coming out on this cold evening. Uh, and I, I also particularly want to thank Molly Neptune Parker and George Neptune um, for making the very long trip from in Indian Township, right? Which is almost five hours from here. Um, and um, as Judy had mentioned, the exhibit that you see is part of the main Arts Commission traditional arts apprenticeship program, which has been going on for 20 years. And the idea behind the apprenticeship program is to pair master elder artists with younger students to keep particular traditions alive. And uh, one of the big parts of the program, especially in the early days, has been Native American basketry in Maine, in among the Wabanaki tribes of Maine. Um, and over the 20 years, there have been many great new basket makers that have come out of this apprenticeship program, including George. Uh, and there's a whole new generation of basket makers. The, the program basically uh, pays a fee for a master elder artist to take on a student, an apprentice, for over the course of a year. And uh, it's been going on for, as I said, 20 years. And it's funded through the National Endowment for the Arts. And we've had apprenticeships from Quebecois step dancing and singing to Cambodian music to Native American basketry. These are just a sample of some of the apprenticeships. And that's the catalog two by 10 that you're welcome to. Um, so this evening, um, we were gonna talk a little bit about um, the importance of the master in keeping cultural traditions alive and seeing the idea of an elder as an important part of the entire culture, especially in native cultures, elders are very revered, which is not always the case, I think, in a lot of what's going on in contemporary life. And um, Molly, in particular, is a particularly talented basket maker, and she's also taught many, many younger people, many people in her family, and is kind of a wealth of knowledge about traditional Passamaquoddy culture. So I thought we would start, Molly, if you don't mind, uh, just talking a little bit about your own family background in basket making. You come from a long line of basket makers. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, uh, my mother and my grandmother were basket makers. And I started when I was six years old. Uh, I watched my mother and my grandmother make baskets at home. Uh, that was a long time ago. So I've been making baskets for about 61 years, probably longer than most of you, uh, your ages. Uh, I was sitting with my grandmother uh, watching her make baskets, watching her and my mom 
because I used to watch my dad go out with a burlap bag under his arms and an axe. I said, Dad, where are you going? I'm going to go cut some ash so I can bring some back for your mother to make baskets. So he never would bring a whole log because he says it was too much work. It was too heavy for him to lug from the woods. Sometimes he'd walk four or five miles and then he would uh, bring back a whole bag of ash that he's found it. And then as years went by, he would go out in the woods with a truck and then he would bring the log back. And he used to uh, pound ash himself. So I started to uh, watch him, and I would watch him do it. And I said, well, I think I can do that, Dad. I can help you. So I would watch him, and then I'd start, I'd take an ax, and I would start pounding. I did that with him for many years. My dad lived up to be 90. And he did it right up to he was about 80 years old. That was only his part-time work because he was a welder. He worked in the shipyard here in Portland, for South Portland, for many, many years. And uh, when he was at home, he used to pound ash for my mom. And uh, uh, my mother would be split in the materials, which is what you see there between these two pieces of boards, and that's what my, uh, I think that belonged to my grandmother. And uh, so she'd be sitting there preparing the materials, and I'd have my gauges. He would, you know, she would have her little handmade tools, and I'd be watching them prepare the materials and make baskets, and uh, everyone, that was at the house that was doing this type of work was anywhere from, I'd say, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. And they've done this for, for it seems like forever. And they kept active in making baskets, not only the fancy baskets that I have over there, but also baskets that are used for, uh, you know, picking, apples or potatoes or vegetables and whatever. So we've done this forever, it seems like. And now we teach in the, the younger ones. I have grandchildren, I have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren that are making baskets. So it really is a family tradition too, yes. right? Do you think most basket making skills are passed on to Yes, they are. Families? Yes, they are. Uh, the youngest great-grandchild that I have that's making baskets is, you see, how old is Alana? Six? I think she's the youngest of the seven. She's the youngest of the great-grandchild that is now making baskets. So how many can, how many generations of basket makers have been? It's the Neptune family, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe about, what, seven? Seven generations. Seven generations of basket makers. And that's from both sides, from the Neptunes and from the Newell side, which is my mother, you know, and they've always made baskets. And you're, let's see, William Neptune was um, a tribal governor. Of he he the was Pasma a Christ. tribal chief right. for many, many years. And he was, he was a traditional chief. And my grandfather, on my, my father's side, he was a tradition, he was not a traditional. He was like elected, but uh, William Neptune was a traditional. And that's George's great grandfather. Great great, 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 great grandfather. grandfather. Yeah, yeah. So you have a long tradition of Passamaquoddy leaders and basket makers yes. in your family. Yes. And I'm proud to say that I was the first woman elected sub-chief of my tribe. And I was elected for four years and council member many, many years. So, but that is part of my family, not only as a basket maker, but also as uh, elected or tribal traditional uh, chiefs. And then it goes on from one after the other. 
Um, and also Molly, I should mention, is the president of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, which is a intertribal cultural organization to help conserve uh, the tradition of Wabanaki basketry in Maine. And you've been the president of that for, for about, what, six, six, six years? Six or seven years, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Um, so in terms of passing on the skills, um, when you were growing up, how did you learn? You mentioned just hanging around kind of and picking it up. Yeah, well, uh, with my uh, mother and grandmother, they, you know, they'd be sitting around and making baskets. And since uh, the ash that we use for basket making is so precious, they would uh, just allow me to use scraps. And that's how I learned. And I would make little candy baskets or little tiny baskets, you know, from some of the scraps that my mother would discard on the floor. Yeah, and... Um, that's how I picked it up. And then as years went by, I only do it, you know, did it as a part-time thing uh, because I did other other things. And has that changed, do you think? That, I mean, when the idea of, like when George first got interested in basket no, making. George used the good stuff. <laughs> ah. He didn't have to uh, use scraps. He used my good materials. Ah, so. And Really? George, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how you first got interested in basket making? Uh, well, I just remember, um, well, actually, I've been making baskets as long as I can remember. Um, I started making baskets with my grandmother when I was about four years old. Um, and then by the time I was seven, I was able to start a basket, mind you, not anything like this, but I was able to start the bottom and complete a basket on my own. Um, I didn't need my grandmother's help. I distinctly remember um, standing up at her counter um, in the kitchen while she cut ash and she gave me a few um, scraps of red ash and um, let me start my basket. And that's one of the earliest memories that I have. Um, so I was definitely very lucky in the sense that um, my grandmother actually sat me down and showed me how rather than the way um, her mother taught her and her grandmother where she would just watch and hopefully learn. Um, but I lived with my grandmother for a while when I was a kid, um, when I was very young, both me and my mother. Um, and then my grandmother and I were always very close. Um, if you ask me, I didn't really have um, a mother and a father. I had my mother and my grandmother. Uh -huh. um, so I spent a lot of time with my grandmother and Tuesdays was my day at Graham's. I would get off the bus at her house on a Tuesday and then stay the night and then get back on the school bus on Wednesday. Um, and I would play with the kids in the afternoon because um, I wasn't the only one who got off the bus there. And when um, everybody else went home after supper, my grandmother would always sit down and start making baskets. And rather than just sit down and watch TV, um, I decided one day that I wanted to make baskets with her too. Do you think that's unusual for your generation to to want to hang out with your grandma and pick something up like that? Um, I think so because, um, I don't know, especially now everybody's kind of living in the age of Facebook where everything is fast and everything comes very quickly. and. They'd rather play video games or watch movies and things like that, or not even watch movies now um, because movies take too long. Uh -huh. So, um, I mean, I was definitely kind of an oddball in the sense that, um, you know, I was in the generation where video games had just started to become more of a bigger thing, like more than just the very pixelated um, video games that came out. Um, so, while my friends were inside, you know, playing with the latest video game system that came out, um, I was outside and playing with my friends, and I was more interested in learning about the traditional medicines and making baskets with my grandmother and learning beadwork and doing much more, I guess, artsy things than my friends were. And you just graduated from Dartmouth, right? Yes. Yep. 
How, what did your friends at Dartmouth think of your basket making? Um, well, I mean, a lot of them had heard that I'd been making baskets, um, but it wasn't something that I did very often at school. Um, there was one summer where I did do it over the summer um, because we have that sale every summer. Um, and so my roommate got to see me make baskets, and she also got to see a lot of the mess that I make when I'm making baskets all over our apartment. Um, and I think a lot of my friends just didn't quite realize what basket making was. They just kind of pictured, I don't know, I guess things like Easter baskets. And then if I was working on them, they would come up and watch and see, you know, the much more intricate baskets, like the fancy baskets with the flowers that I make and with the woven birds. And they were just kind of astonished at the work that I was doing with materials that used to be a treat. I think that's a good point, Molly. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, do you think most people know all the preparation work that goes into these baskets? They just... No, I don't think too many people know. Uh, in some of my presentations, which I'm sorry I didn't bring with me, I usually carry maybe about a, a two-foot uh, log and a piece of... Uh, ash that's already been pounded out and would look like a fan sitting at the table. Um, I used to carry that with me when I did some presentations. And I don't know, as you get a little older, you forget. <laughs> <laughs> so it must be sitting in my garage or somewhere. It's also heavy too, it right? It is, it is so. Now why uh, is ash such a good wood for baskets? It's pliable and you know, like once it's pounded, I mean, I've watched my father, I've watched a lot of people, and I've even done it myself. You know, we take a log and then take the bark off and then take an ax or a maul and start pounding away. And then you can see it separate itself as you go along. And then you will take a big piece of uh, the materials that you can get from the log and take a a knife or whatever that you use for a tool and you can split it so many different times. I mean, it's amazing as to what you can come up with, but not every log is usable. Some of the stuff that you can get from the woods is brittle or is just, you know, discolored and stuff like that. And we don't use that type of wood. So you have to know what you're looking for, and you have to know what you can use. So part of being a basket maker is also no, going out and yes. knowing the trees? Yeah, knowing the trees and what is, uh, I mean, like George and I can probably go out there, and I would know what I would want, but maybe he doesn't, you know? But once it's at home and it's pounded, he would know if it's, good materials to be used for baskets. So you actually have to know what you're looking for and what kind of log you're looking for. Because there's brown ash, there's white, there's black, there's yellow, and all the, the best type of materials to use actually is yellow ash. And once it's pounded, it looks like the color of her scarf. It's a very pretty pink. Huh. And it stays that way, where brown ash will turn either brown or sort of like a beige color after it dries. Some stays white, but not a lot. And it colors, you know, it changes color as time goes on. Uh -huh. Huh. Yeah, but yellow ash stays that color because I've made several baskets out of uh, yellow ash, and it stays that way. It stays pink. Yeah. Sounds like it's a lot of physical exercise too. It is. It is. I mean, I mean, my hands are probably stronger than most twenty-year-old kid around. <laughs> and I've, yeah. I've heard the splitter, the ash splitter, called the original thigh master. Yes. By basket makers, <laughs> because yeah. you have to use you got to use strength, strength. Right? You know, you put it through that, and you pull and pull until. You know, you get the, uh, to get to what you're looking for, you know, in materials, yeah. So a lot of this is, um, it's skill about um, 
the styles and the techniques, and then there's physical skill involved with it yes. too. Yes, yes, it is. Could you talk yes. a little bit about getting sweet grass to the other uh, oh. part of basket making? That's an awful dirty job. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what you do is you go to, uh, uh, you find a patch of sweetgrass near a saltwater marsh. And, you know, you have to go. And it used to grow, all, you know, there's so much out there. But now you have, when you go to a marsh, you'd, you know, you'd find a sweetgrass patch here and there. And it's all mixed in. So you actually have to know what you're looking for. And a lot of times, you know, you can find witch grass and sweet grass grown together. So, but there is a difference. And you actually have to look closer. The sweet grass is shiny when it's growing in the marsh. And witch grass looks almost alike. And it almost smells like it. But once you braid it, you can break it just like, you know, just like breaking a piece of grass, you know, for uh, for the sweet grass, you can't break it because, as you can see over there, I have straight sweet grass and then I have braided grass. But which grass, if it's braided, you can still break it. Uh -huh. And it gives the baskets that great smell. Yes, right? yes, and the smell stays for many, many years. What I've done is some of the baskets that I have that are old, I just take my hand, dip it in water, and brush, you know, get it a little bit wet. And you can smell the sweet grass coming right, you know, coming through. And I think you once told me that you could tell if you walked into somebody's house if they were a basket maker by the smell. Yeah, my house smells like sweet grass. And that's what, my, as a matter of fact, I had to call one of my granddaughters to come over to load up my truck because George wasn't uh, back from another trip. So um, she says, I love coming to your house because it smells like sweet grass, you know. And she says, you know, it's funny how you can distinguish people's houses. She said, with Grammy Irene, all I can smell is pine soil. <laughs> and she says, with your house, I can smell sweet grass. And with my, with George's Grams, I mean, she went on and on how different house smells different. And with mine, it's all you can smell is sweet grass. Because I have sweet grass, I have baskets, I have ash, and everything right there in the house. Uh huh. Yeah. That's, uh, could we yeah. pass that around so people, or sure. the grass itself? Yeah, yeah. The, you can Please. pass that around. This is a little, it's a little moist, and this is braided. You, you can also, they can see that too. You can smell how nice it smells. That's a great um, image about how grand, different grandmothers' houses smell. Yeah. Because my grandmother's house used to smell like cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> and I always knew that I was at her house. You yeah. Know? And when I smell cabbage, now I think of her. So. Yeah. Do you think of your grandma when you smell sweetgrass or? Just the idea of uh, certain smells being associated with being with your grandma? I definitely, I definitely do um, associate sweetgrass with my grandmother. Um, I actually associate sweetgrass with a lot of my ancestors. Um, I'm, I'm very spiritual, just being raised on the reservation and also my own chosen path. And I know um, a lot of times when I feel like some of my grandmothers, like her mother or even my grandmother Frances, who I've never met, a lot of them will reach out to me um, in the sense that I could be in a place and I'll smell sweet grass and no one else will be able to smell it. Um, so it's definitely a smell that um, I associate with ancestors and um, kind of with the matrilineage of my family. And I'm sure um, I'm positive it'll be a smell that my grandmother will use to uh, reach out to me one day. So. You are one cool dude, George. I got to tell you that. Your grandma once said that you're an old soul. Uh, and do you think that has something to, has basket making brought that to life in a way or? I think that definitely has um, a big part of it. Because um, I know, um, for example, one thing that I know um, 
if someone tried to do a psychic reading with my grandmother, they just wouldn't be able to tell anything because of the flow of information that would just flood them. Um, and the reason for that is when we make baskets, we're doing the things that our ancestors used to do. We're doing the things that our parents used to do. And we're doing things that our ancestors used to do the way they used to do them, how they used to do them. We're using the materials that they used to use and we're doing them exactly the same way that they used to do them. So in a sense, for me anyway, um, making baskets has always been a way for me to connect with the ancestors that I've never met. So even though we're doing them at different places and at different points in time, basket making is so meditative in a way that even though they're not physically with me anymore, I'm making baskets with all of my grandmothers, not just my grandmother. My great-grandmother is there, my great-great-grandmother is there, my great-great-great-grandmother is there, and they're all watching me as I make my baskets. That's great. Um, and I'm just curious, like, for, because it, we live in such a digital age, do it just seems like there's not that many occasions for younger people to connect to, to the elderly people in their family or their grandparents. And in that sense, you're, you're fortunate. Molly, do you think, you've taught most of your, how many grandchildren have you taught? Well, I, I have, uh, I think, a total of 40 somewhat grandchildren. Uh, something, I have a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, most of them uh, have come over to the house and they would sit down and say, Graham, can I learn to make a basket? Sometimes, if I'm not in a rush, I say, sure, sit down and we'll see what we can do. But the, it seems to me like uh, my little great-granddaughter came over the other night. She says, Grammy, I need to finish my basket. I says, well, I'm too busy. I can't teach you right now. Uh, uh, and uh, I do this all the time. I have to learn to remember to be patient, to be more patient with the little ones. Yeah. So does teaching basket making help you learn new things also? or? Yes, it does. And it, well, it teaches me to be a little bit more patient with the great grandchildren. Yeah. Because I have to figure, you know, they're only four or five years old. So they have to be. But it's amazing, though, you know, thinking about it. Some of them can just pick up and start a basket without too much help. You know, like with George, he more or less taught himself, and his weaves are so much more different than mine, you know, and it's too bad that he's got a couple pieces of baskets, uh, a couple pieces of uh, work in Abbey Museum that I would have wished he'd have, he'd have here with us tonight. And this would show you, you know, the difference between his work and my work, because he created different styles and he picked up a lot of mine. But it also tells you the difference between his, and his work and my work, but will also tell you that he has the same way of doing things in a di in a different sort of way, you know, like I, a family resemblance. Almost. Yes, yes. And most of my daughters make baskets, and I have a lot of grandchildren that makes baskets. And you can tell that they come from my side of the family, even though that their grandparents from the other side also made baskets. But you can see the difference, you know in my style and in my mom's and in his grandmother from his mother's side. So so you could pick a basket out in a crowd and know it was somebody in your family. Somebody in the family. Your yeah. family's known for flowers, one, for one thing, right? Yeah, well, I, from, would yeah. you mind if I got that? Yeah, my mother has always made flowers from ash and sweet grass. The top of that is ash. Yeah, the top of the, uh, the this basket here is uh, the flowers 
uh, brown ash and sweet grass. And uh, my mother has made those, for, it seems like forever. And uh, she and her mom always made flower baskets. So you have to really know how to thin the ash. Oh, God. That's, that's pretty, yes, it looks it like is. paper. It's, it's a double thin, ba thin ash. And we use that little tool right there. The splitter. Uh, the splitter, I call it. And we have to split that so many different times, you know. And uh, George can do it. Now he told me, oh, there's no way I could learn how to do that. I says, well, you got to. I'm not going to be around forever to do it for you. <laughs> so this year, uh, this summer, as a matter of fact, he borrowed one of the uh, splitters that I had Yeah, that used to belong to my mom. And he and he would sit down, and he he says, "My hands are too sore. I can't do that, you know." And his fingers would get blisters and would get cuts, and they still do. But but not mine. I mean that I'm used to that. And but you know, it's not for sissies being a basket maker, I guess, no. right? No. <laughs> and you create muscles, right? <laughs> George, you, one of, you've taken the sig one of the signature of kind of the flower and done something really interesting too, right? You have a signature for your uh, baskets. Yes. Um, my, I like to carry on the family tradition and using the flowers. Um, and though I know I could make flowers that, looks, that look like my grandmother's, um, I kind of create my own. I have a couple over there. Um, for example, my um, that, one of the you? things, uh, either that one or the other one behind it. Yeah, grab that one, it's a better example. <laughs> um, like my flowers are much smaller than my grandmother's, um, which I can't quite understand <laughs> since my hands and fingers are so big. Um, but I just really enjoy making them very small. Um, and another thing that we do, um, my grandmother taught me how to make um, woven ash birds. Um, and since then, um, she's kind of nicely agreed not to teach anybody else. Um, and I don't teach anybody either because I use them as a signature on my baskets. Um, I'll weave a small bird and make almost like a nest type area on top of the basket so that there's a little bird sitting on top. Um, and recently I've um, taken to going out into the woods and grabbing tree branches. Um, so far my favorite is red willow because of the bright, um, the bright red bark. Um, and I wish I had this piece here with me, but I haven't, I've been so busy. Um, I haven't been able to go to the Abbey to pick it up, but, um, I will, we, I will attach, um, rather large, um, red willow branches to the top of the basket. And then I'll weave small flowers and attach those to the branches so that the flowers almost look as if they're blooming off of the tree. Um, and I've modified her bird design, um, even more and taken what was just kind of a plain bird, almost like a sparrow or a chickadee, um, and turned it into a hummingbird. Um, so on that one particular piece that I'm actually picking up for our show in Orono tomorrow, um, I have those hummingbirds attached to the branches as well, and I attach them in a way so that they look like they're eating from the flowers. Nice. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the, the sale in Orono that's coming up, the annual basket making sale? Um, I brought some information with me, so what I'll do is, uh, I'm glad you reminded me, I told Teresa that I will make sure I leave some out and hand them out to different people here that are here today. Um, there'll be at least, I think, about between, what, 40 and 50 different basket makers in Orin or at the Hudson Museum, and every one of us do our own style of baskets and take them to the museum to sell every year. That's once a year, just before Christmas. And we'll have collectors and people from all over that will come over to buy baskets from us. This has been sort of like a tradition for the last, what, how many years now? 10, 15 years, yeah. Yeah, the Bar Harbor show is in July. And that's, uh, that's been going on for quite a few years. Yeah, so uh, each year we have our different places that we go to 
to sell baskets and, well, naturally, and then we have the Common Ground Fair, and then we have, let's see, we have the Common Ground Fair in September, and then we have the Bar Harbor in July, and then we have the December one at the Hudson Museum. So each year we have so many different places that we go to, and then for myself, I go everywhere. I mean, I've gone to Washington, D.C., to, uh, to Louisiana, to Texas, to everywhere to sell baskets. So my baskets are all over, and George travels a lot. He's taken baskets to, um, to Spain, to, I knew one of the grandchildren that went to China, took some baskets and gave, it, gave them to the host family that they stayed with at, you know, different times. And uh, I, I don't know, you, uh, one of the other children went to Hungary and went to uh, Russia, was it? London. Yeah, and Germany and everywhere. So I've got baskets all over the world now. So are people surprised when they find out about this tradition? Yes, and we've had some uh, uh, students from uh, different colleges and different schools that my grandchildren go to that we host the uh, children ourselves, and they take their work, our uh, my work, back with them when they go back home from Hawaii, Germany, and everywhere. So we've got baskets all over now. So, uh, and then I send little cards with them, which I've got here for you too. So uh, you can keep as souvenirs or just tell people, hey, I know this old Indian lady. She makes baskets. <laughs> yeah. Sure, or they can get up and come check them out. And yeah, we've got some cards here also. Um, so, in a way, you also, aside from it being good for your health, it's also a community too, right? Yes, it is. We have, oh God, we've got about at least. I could have counted, maybe like, let's say about 15, 20 years ago, I could have counted about half a dozen or so basket makers. But now everybody, uh, quite a few tribal members make baskets, and they would come over and sit down and help us with basket making. And now everybody, it seems like in every family, makes baskets, which is good. It was, it, there was a time when it was kind of disappearing, right? Yeah, I would have sworn that we were going to lose the art of basket making. But now even the young men, the young girls, uh, we have Jeremy Frey, who is a well-known basket maker. Uh, he started, I think, he's only about 30 somewhat years old. Yeah, he's only 32. He's received awards and He's a well-known young basket maker, and a lot of collectors come after his work, like they do with George and with other young people on the reservation. Now it seems that it's like one big family that makes baskets. And when you were growing up, um, basket making was also kind of a, a group effort too, right? Especially with well, the work baskets? Yes, well we used to, I remember my mother selling baskets to, so we can have food, you know, for the house. Or uh, if she need, if any one of the kids needed shoes or clothing, she would go sell baskets someplace and more or less like trade, you know, trade for food, trade for, uh, to sell baskets, to bring money home for, for kids, you know. So ever since I could remember, uh, we've had basket making in my family. Could you talk a little bit about making the the fish scale baskets for the sardine factories? Oh my, yes. Uh, well, when I married uh, my husband, this was back in the late 50s and early 60s, we used to make scale baskets 
and they were huge. They were, uh, I'll have to show you just about, I'll put the mic down and I'll show you how big they were. They were at least 12 by 12 on the bottom and they would stand this high and this big around with two handles on the side and this was, uh, th this particular basket was for fish scales for the fish factories in Eastport, Maine. And we were, we'd make them by the hundreds. We'd start like Monday morning and we'd make a hundred baskets from Monday through Saturday morning and we'd sell them for $3 a piece. Now that particular piece that this lady's looking at now goes for, uh, Though the, that particular piece I would sell for $275 now. And years ago, we have this huge baskets that we would sell for $3. But that $3 went a long way because we'd make 100 baskets from Monday through Saturday morning. So that's $300 we'd share with at least six or seven people in the family. And in, the, in 1960, that was a lot of money. You know, now today, you know, a basket like that one, you, you know, $100 doesn't go far anymore. But in that time, those scale baskets, I don't know how many hundred baskets or how many thousands we made. And they would take the fish scales and use it for to make finger fingernail polish. And I remember going to the pearlescence plant and oh, it was a mess, but they would come up with all those different kinds of fingernail polish. Little do the young girls at that time realize what, where, the, where all this stuff came from, <laughs> from nasty old scales, <laughs> fish scales. Yeah, you know, and it's same, amazing. And same with some other work baskets, like potato baskets, mm -hmm. too. They People used to those, make those, right? Yeah. This is a potato basket now that I use to carry my uh, ash, and there's one. Here's one that's, uh, there's two different kinds. This is all hand-woven one, and this one has nails in it. I don't like nails in baskets, but they're made by two different people. And this one here, uh, We'd sell to the farmers for about 25 cents a piece. Like in the 1960s? Oh, is that God, way, way, uh, even further than that. And they, uh, they'd use it for harvest, hand harvesting the potato. Yeah, and harvest. they'd go through so many potato baskets. Uh, I remember using this size myself when we used to go pick potatoes. And each, each barrel of potato was 25 cents. And we'd take four of these to fill up a barrel, or even, well, bigger baskets, I would say, to fill up a barrel of potatoes. And I think, I'm not too sure as to how much these were, but I know it took quite a bit to fill up a barrel of potatoes. And we'd sell market baskets, clothes baskets. We'd make all kinds of different baskets, backpacks, which we still do today, but they go for two, three hundred dollars today, where years ago they were probably only fifty cents, a dollar or two dollars. So in matter of time, no matter how, uh, how inexpensive they were, how, how expensive they are today, there's still a lot of work that's put into the basket. Because you figure you have to go in the woods, cut down a log, bring the log back and pound it by hand and then strip it and then put it, you know, split it like that and then make it into so many different kinds. Later on, you can come and see some of the materials that we use, and but it's time consuming to do all of this. And it's something that uh, I still do at home you know, and I'm 71 years old, but I still do it because I love 
making baskets. And I like to just sit down and start stripping. As George can tell you, it's not easy. He, he, he got up one day, he says, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> he went home. So <laughs> the next day, here comes George again. I need some mash to make baskets. I said, well, sit down and learn how to split materials. So he sat down and he had to ask his grandmother, his great grandmother, Grammy Irene, you gotta help me, he kept saying. So he used her material, her gauges and her splitter in order for him to learn. He had to ask her spirit to help him. And that's how he learned. So now he can sit down and do, not as good as me, <laughs> but, but he can do it. And it took time with a lot of patience. It takes time to learn everything you want to do. Which is probably a, a good life lesson, right? It is. It really is. And that's what I tell all my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. If you want to do baskets, you have to learn from getting the log to the splitting, the everything else. And I do that all the time with all my great-grandchildren. I have an eight-year-old son. He's, to me, he's my son, but he's my great-grandson. I adopted him when he was five months old, and along with how many children totally that I raised, I think I raised a total of 12 to 14 kids, and they were all my, six of them were my natural children, and four or five I adopted, and I raised others as foster children. So everyone knows how to make baskets, except for one. <laughs> That's my middle daughter, she says. Now she's coming over next week. She says, I gotta make a basket for my boyfriend. <laughs> I says, well, you're gonna have to learn quick, huh? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so yeah, she's going to finally learn, though. She's going to have cuts and bruises on her little fingers. I don't know how she's going to be able to do her work at work, at the office. <laughs> That's great. You are great, Molly, really. Um, I just have one final question, um, and that's that about the Passamaquoddy language that... Um, you grew up speaking Passamaquoddy as your first language, right? Or Yes. And could you talk a little bit about how basket making is also a way of keeping languages alive? Well, when we, uh, when two, three of us are sitting around, especially when my mother was alive, she and I would be sitting there talking Passamaquoddy and just, you know, just sitting there making baskets. and. Now, uh, not too many of our younger children can speak the language, even though they teach it at school. Just recently, George has picked up quite a few uh, Passamaquoddy words, and he can understand mostly everything that I say. Uh, my ch uh, yeah, he's good at listening. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm a fluent Passamaquoddy speaker. Uh, that's why sometimes I have to think first before I can say something in English to you, because I think in Passamaquoddy first, and then it comes out, you know, in English as my second language. So that's why I know I took classes years ago, and I wanted to say it was at the University of Maine in Orono, and this professor said to me, he says, you have to take a language. I says, I do. I says, I'm talking it now to you. That's my second language. I says, English is my second language. Passamaquoddy is my first. He looked at me, he says, I'll have to take that to the dean and find out whether we will approve it. They did. <laughs> 
him, why would I have to take up French? Well, George speaks uh, Spanish fluently. So he had to do a second language or a third language. So George can speak three languages now, Spanish, English, and Passamaquoddy. So for me, English is my second language. Passamaquoddy is my first. And so when you make baskets, are you thinking about, do you think about the instructions, let's say, in Passamaquoddy? It, everything that I do comes out in Passamaquoddy first. You know, I think in Passamaquoddy. It might come out just, you know, even especially in basket making. Everything that, you know, I do in baskets is in Passamaquoddy. And how, would you mind saying the word for brown ash in Passamaquoddy? Wick. Wikpihig, Wikpihig means ash, and the baskets is Bersnodeel. Which we de be chand li Bersnodeek driven. I'm telling you now that uh, we've always made baskets. You know, Bersnodeel is baskets, and uh, bers, uh, my mother would say, "Don't we lick pesau? You have to cut ash. Lick pesau means ash." And you have to be able to do and say everything in Passamaquoddy. But I've been talking. You know, when I first started school, I went into school. I didn't know what they were talking about. And this lady would say, you can't speak that. How am I supposed to, what am I supposed to say? Because I was thinking in Passamaquoddy. I was talking Passamaquoddy, not only for some of the things that we had to learn in school, but in my art. To me, you know, basket making is something that I learned from my mother, from my grandmother. A lot of people say, well, you know, a lot of people say it's art. To me, it's just something that I grew up with it as from little girl to today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real honor to have both of you here.